sitting again. If you can, put your hands together. Give God a hand of praise right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a great and marvelous God we serve. Listen, do me a quick favor. Just reach over and give somebody a hug and tell them how glad you are to see them, how nice they look today, how sweet they smell and all of that good stuff. If somebody got their hair did, tell them it looks good and nice outfit you got on. Uh, you might be going through, but your show don't look like what you're going through right now. Anybody beside me glad you don't look like what you've been going through? God's been keeping you. He's been covering you. He's been sustaining you. God's been better to me than I even know how to be to myself. Y'all all right back there in the back? Y'all good? Everybody straight? All right. Bless you. I know it's a little uh, crowded in here, but this is a good problem to have. So we're glad that you're here with us and celebrating God for his goodness and his grace and his mercy. Listen, we're going to try to free up just a little bit of space. So for those uh, children who are here today, uh, particularly if you are 12 years old and under, if you would like to participate uh, in our children's church hour, uh, you may do that uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, they will be going over. If you would just come stand over here by this door, uh, right here to my right, to your left, uh, our children's church workers. Thank you, Minister Moore, for going there. Our children's church workers will be there to attend to them and uh, help them during this time. All children 12 and under. If you are a teen and you just want to help uh, out with that segment, you just want to help the kids, you can go and be a part of that as well. Uh, but only if you feel uh, led to go and be a part. Uh, we love for you to go and help our children uh, learn more about the word of the Lord. Amen. Can y'all give it up for our band today? Yeah. Amen. They are absolutely off the chain, off the chain. We know uh, Brother Gerald Affling and Brother Ivan has come and blessed us on several occasions. Got a guest bass player and drummer on today. Uh, what's your name, bro? That's Jamal Parks, and you, Al, amen, and bro, Al, let's give it up for them, blessing us today. I walked up in here and I almost started dancing. I had to remember I was at church, man. They, they were killing it, man. Thank God so much for them coming to share with us on today and being a blessing. Listen, let's go to the book of St. Matthew chapter number nine. St. Matthew chapter number nine. I will lift up a few verses in your hearing from St. Matthew chapter number 9, beginning at verse number 14. St. Matthew chapter number 9, and we'll begin reading at verse number 14. Through verse number 17. I will be reading from the King James Version of the Holy Writ, St. Matthew chapter number 9, verses 14 through verse 17. If you found a shout, whoop, there it is. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? For the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. I want to speak for just a few moments and sort of massage into your spirit a lesson in fasting. 
a lesson in, in fasting. For those of you who are taking notes, allow for me to cross-pollinate early in this moment uh, by submitting to you that what I have just read in your hearing from St. Matthew chapter number 9, you can also find it written in the Gospel of St. Mark chapter number 2, beginning at verse number 18, if you're taking note, and also St. Luke chapter 5, starting at verse number 33. In either one of those instances, in either one of those cases and scenarios, what you will ultimately discover is that what I've just read in your hearing will actually be found in those other two places in Scripture. It is found in Luke chapter 2, uh, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse number 33, and St. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse number 18. The question now becomes, why then, if the same passages can be located in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, then why is it that we would have read from the gospel as recorded by St. Matthew? Well, the answer is quite simple. The reason I read it from the Gospel of Matthew instead of Mark or Luke is because it actually, in terms of a sequence, has a little bit to do with Matthew himself. So why not read it from the Gospel that's recorded by St. Matthew if the sequence has something to do with him? Uh, just to run a quick reference, if you to read a few verses prior to verse number 14 in St. Matthew chapter 9, you will actually see the actual discipling of Matthew himself, whereby Jesus calls St. Matthew from, from his livelihood. He was a tax collector. The Bible calls him Levi. He was sitting at the table collecting the taxes, and Jesus simply walks by and says two words to him, follow me. Uh, th there was no prestidigitation, there was no abracadabra, there were no miracles being performed, there was no turning of water into wine, there was no healing the sick or raising of the dead. Jesus simply sees a man at work doing his job, says to him, follow me, and just like that, this man gets up from the table and begins to follow Jesus. Therein is a glorious revelation of the profundity of his words. Uh, the, the potency, how profound and how potent, how powerful his words are that someone could be doing that which is familiar to them for year in and year out. And one word from God can literally move you forward. I tried to tell you it's not just a cliche, but it's actually how God is. How can you be a tax collector for years? That's how you earn your money. That's how you earn your living. It is how you provide and take care of your family. And Jesus simply comes to him without showing him any sign or wonder and says, follow me. And just like that, he begins to follow Jesus. He leaves his government job to do a God job. He leaves his secular job to do a spiritual job. In fact, he leaves his job simply to follow Jesus. He leaves from that which is worldly to do something that is wordly. What kind of God could speak the words, follow me, and just like that you get up? Do you know what that tells me about Matthew? That tells me that although he had a job and although he was able to provide and take care of his family, there was still something missing in his life. Please don't get it twisted. Just because you're doing well in one area, it does not necessitate well-being in every other area of your life. Somebody in this room can be a witness to the fact that just because you have a good job doesn't mean you have a good marriage. And just because you have a good marriage does not mean that you have the best children. And just because you have the best children doesn't mean that it's well in your body. You can be making A's in one area and F's in another area of your life. Which is why when we come to church, none of us have room to point the finger at anybody else. My problem might not be your problem. And your issue might not be mine. But everybody in here got an issue somewhere in their life. I think the people outside the church really have a problem with this, and it confuses them because somewhere along the line, somebody mistakenly told them that the reason we come to church is because we have it all together. 
But you and I, we know better than that. We don't come to this place because we have it together. We keep coming because we're trying to get it together. I got some messed up ways, some craziness, and some foolishness about me. And the only reason I keep coming as often as I keep coming is because there's something on the inside of me that I need God to work out of me. And I need you and him to be patient with me until I finally become everything that God would have me to be. It was Matthew who understood that there was more to life than what I was experiencing. The world was bigger than the one that I was living in. If we asked Matthew, I believe that's what he would tell us because he was a tax collector, one who was looked down upon by the people because they were known for cheating people out of their taxes. They would say that they owed $100 and they only owed 90 and so they would keep the 10 for themselves. They were cheating people out of their taxes. They, they, they had no respect amongst the people, especially amongst the Jews, because they felt like they were traitors who were working for the Roman government. And so as a consequence, they were really looked down upon. But yet it was this brother Matthew that Jesus says to him, follow me. You got to be careful of who you kick to the curb. The same people that we kick to the curbs are the ones that Jesus looks at and says, follow me. He's got a plan even for the life of the people that you don't like. Can I get a witness from three people in this room? That's why you got to be careful of who you talk about and who you laugh at. You might find out that the same people you don't like, you're going to have to spend eternity with them in heaven. And so it is that he calls this brother out and says to him, follow me. And just like that, look at your neighbor and say, just like that. Just like that, he gets up from the table and he follows Jesus. There was no cataclysmic move of God. It was not like pulling teeth. He just got up and began to follow Jesus because there is something about his words, something about his speech that, that is enticing. There is a power when he speaks that lets you know that everything is going to be all right. Have you ever considered the fact that Jesus had 12 disciples and all of them forsook all to follow him. That means they left their jobs to follow him. They, 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 in so many cases, left their families just to follow Jesus. And although they left their jobs, we never saw the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread. Jesus, one man, took care of 12 grown men and they lacked nothing in their life. No wonder it was so easy for those 12 men to look after and take care of Jesus. Because if one man could take care of 12 men, truly now 12 men should have been able to take care of one Jesus. And so it is that he calls this brother out of darkness into the marvelous light. But in it interesting. You read your Bible. If you read your Bible, it'll teach you something. And don't read it too fast. You got to take your time and read it because if you speed read, you're going to miss more than you really catch. Isn't it interesting that after he called Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, the next scenario deals with cases and points of Jesus who would oftentimes or on often occasions, he would sit down and he would have a meal with people that were considered to be sinners, scums, and scoundrels. He would often sit down and just break bread with people that other people thought that they were sinners and scum and scoundrels. Several translations would refer to them as such. How can you, Jesus, being high and holy, have a conversation with people who are sinners? How could you sit down and have lunch and break bread with people that you know are liars and backbiters and cheaters and stealers? How, how in the world could you do something like that? And Jesus had to say something to them that I think needs to be spoken to the church today, that those who are well don't need physicians. Those who are sick need physicians. If you can remember growing up in school, they taught us in kindergarten, first and second grade, that if a fire breaks out, there are three things that you got to remember. If you can remember back from first grade, they told you to stop, drop. Somebody went to elementary school like me. They told you to stop, drop, and roll. Say it with me. Stop, drop, and roll. One more time. Stop, drop, and do you know who that does not apply to? It does not apply to the fireman that shows up to your house when it's on fire. <laughs> that went over somebody's head. 
You see, when, when you are under attack as a civilian, then you stop, drop, you roll. You get out of the burning house. But when the fireman shows up, to, he is not trying to get away from the fire. He's running to the fire. Can I tell you why the church is so ineffective? It's because we're running away from what everybody else is running away from. But when you've really been called by God into ministry, when you've really been anointed by God, what everybody else runs away from, that's what you run into. You are to high five your neighbor and tell them that's why I'm anointed that's that's why God uses me because what makes everybody else afraid I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help knowing that all my help is coming from God so he does not run from sinners but rather he runs to sinners because Jesus understands and please don't get it twisted if I go into their environment they're not going to change me I'm going to change them Everybody can't say this in every environment, but if you feel like I feel, wherever I go, I'm a headlight. I ain't the tail light. I'm not going to follow the world. The world going to follow me. It, it ain't going to change the game on me. I'm going to change the game on it. That's why some of y'all, a whole lot of people like to see you coming, especially, you know, back in the day, you know, back in the old you day, you know, when you used to show up at the party, you know, everybody got happy when you showed up because everywhere you went, you were the life of the party. Who can remember that for six of y'all in here? Go on and be honest. You remember when you were the life of the party. I tried to tell you, it's three type of people that show up at every party. You're going to have the people that come in and they're just going to sit around the wall. You know, they're just going to stand up and look and see what everybody else is doing, you know, waiting on something to pop off. You know, they high-fiving each other. They just wall huggers, you know. They're just standing up around the wall. They ain't doing nothing. They ain't bringing nothing, you know. These are people, they, they are thermometers. They're not thermostats. <laughs> thermometers, they measure the temperature, but the thermostat sets the temperature. You so so these are just the one that if it's cold in the building, they're going to be cold. If it get hot in the building, then they'll get hot. But then you got another group of people that, you know, they ain't been out in a long time. They just glad to finally get a break. You know, they, they just come in. They just sit at the table. They get their little drink. They drink what they drink. You know, they, they get their Patron. You know, they get they whatever they drink. I don't know the names of that stuff, you know, but somebody throw me out a name that they drink. I, I don't know. So somebody, Ciroc, okay, whatever that is, you know. Know, they get whatever they drink and they sip on their thing. And, hey, good, how you doing? You know, they got on our outfit and stuff. We just glad to be out. We ain't messing with nobody. You know, if our song come on, we might tip our glass up a little bit and rock to the beach, you know what I'm saying? But we ain't finna go out on the dance floor because our feet still hurt and we got these shoes on. So we just gonna chill, you know, right here, baby. You don't dance no more. All they do is this. They just gonna do that right there. But then you got a third group of people, you know my kind of folk, that as soon as they hit the door, baby, they just, they just all crunk, all crazy, soon as they hit the door, because as soon as they get in there, they know it's about to turn up for real, for real, because they are the life of the party. Every now and then, God needs some people like that in the body of Christ, that as soon as they hit the door, they come in on ready. They come in on automatic. They don't need no choir. They don't need no band to get them crunk. They was ready in the car on the way to the, I wish I had somebody who knows what I'm talking about that you don't need nobody to become your ventriloquist to slip their hand up your backside and make you say hallelujah, make you say thank you Jesus, and make you say God is good. This morning when I rose, I didn't have no doubt. I knew the Lord would take care of me. I knew the Lord would provide for me. I knew he'd lead and guide me all the way. When David said magnify the Lord with me, that's just called common courtesy. Please don't get it twisted. I can praise him all by myself. I can give him glory when it ain't nobody but me and God. Every now and then he's looking for somebody who will take the road, who will, who will follow him and not need anybody to accent their ministry, who will not need anybody to accent their level of motivation. Someone who will run to the fire instead of running away from the fire, which is why he would often assemble himself with sinners and scum and scoundrels. Here's why, because Jesus knew something that church folk in 2018 don't understand, that sometimes the best people in church are the ones that just came off the streets. 
Y'all don't want to hear that for real. Y'all don't want to hear that. See, some of us, we didn't gotten too familiar with church. We too comfortable with church now. And so since we got the church language, we got the church lingo, we got the church dress code all together, now we're good and familiarity can breed contempt. Sometimes you can be around something so long until your feelings for it begin to diminish, you know. It ain't that exciting to you anymore because you've been doing church for so long until, you know, I, I clap my hands when I feel like it, you know. I, I say amen if I ain't too tired, but, but when it's somebody who doesn't even understand about our budgets and our bank accounts and board meetings and, and they don't understand about robber's rules or order, they, they don't care nothing about your title, they don't care nothing about your position, they don't care if you was the first member of the church, they don't care how much money you put in, all they want to know is do you have an anointing on your life? Do you have a word for me? I don't care nothing about that other stuff. I don't know all the song the choir be singing. I don't know all them scriptures that the preacher be calling out. I don't know nothing about that. All I know is one day when I was lost, he died up on a cross, and I know that it was the blood for me. He would go to these individuals because he knew and understood that there would be a commitment to him that other people might not necessarily have with him because when you really need God, God. There is something about your need for God that will cause you to commit to him in a way that other people who have options and choices might not be able to commit to him. Okay, y'all looking at me in that tone of voice. I wasn't going to go here, but since you're looking at me like that, I might as well get GED and real hood with you. You see, when you already got it together, then you use God as if he's an option. You know, maybe I'll pick up God. Maybe I won't pick up God, but it's about four of us in this room right now that every day that you wake up it's not an option. You don't get a choice in the matter. I don't get to do this. I got to do this. It's in him that I live and move and have my be maybe you can wake up in the morning and not tell him thank you for keeping you all night last night but when I get up in the morning before my feet hit the flow before I wipe the crust out my eyes I gotta tell you thank you for letting me see another I should have been, I could have been, I would have been dead sleeping in my grave but the only reason I'm alive is because you look beyond my fault you saw every one of my knees and touched me with the finger of love so I don't get to preach. I got to preach. Woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel of peace and of truth. And so he understands that he's dealing with sinners because there's a level of appreciation that will come from people who understand that I'm being loved despite the fact that I'm unlovely. I'm being liked in spite of the fact that I'm not even like a bull. I'm being blessed despite the fact that I really don't deserve to be blessed. And it's interesting that in one case, watch it, he calls Matthew from the tax collector's table. And then there's a case in point of Jesus breaking bread with sinners. And then finally, when we get to verse number 14, it's still in your Bible. If you hadn't turned it off your cell phone yet, if you hadn't closed the pages of your Bible, it's still in verse number 14. Then cometh the disciples of John, John the Baptist, and the disciples of the Pharisees who asked Jesus a very legitimate question. They say to him, uh, why is it that we fast, Jesus, but your disciples don't fast? As a matter of fact, we don't just fast, but we fast oft, O-F-T. We often fast. We, we don't just fast every now and then. We, we don't fast every blue moon. I mean, it ain't enough for us to fast about two, three times in a month, man. We'll go 24 hours and not even eat anything, and we do it all the time. Now, how is it that your disciples don't do it? By the way, think about it. The disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees should not be as close to God as the disciples of Jesus himself are. So how is it that we don't get to walk and talk with you every day and we fast and here it is, they walk and talk with you every day and they don't fast. Please, church folk, don't allow folk that don't know God like you to out-worship you. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't allow people to out-love God you. Don't allow anybody to out honor and recognize and give credit and credence and uh, make obeisance and homage to God more than you 
do. You see, there are a lot of things you can do better than me. There are a lot of gifts in this room, but one thing that I'm determined not to let any of y'all beat me at, you ain't going to be more grateful to God than I am. I'm, I'm going to tell God, thank you for the little things in my life, man. I, I thank him for stuff like a roof over my head and clothes on my back. I thank him for stuff like feet that actually put one foot in front of the other. I'm, I'm talking about things like when you inhale and exhale and it ain't no problem for you to do that. I thank him for little things like that. Some of y'all get mad because you ain't got no Coca-Cola or Pepsi in the refrigerator. I still thank God for water out the faucet. I don't know how y'all feel about it. I, I thank God for, for water that come out the little hydrant, that come out the hose pipe. I mean, I just thank God for any and everything that he does. And so they ask him that since your disciples are so close to you, why don't they fast? And here it is that we're fasting extremely often. Jesus says something very profound. Found that this is why I came here today. This is the part that I needed you to grasp. Jesus says this. Don't miss this. Look at your name. Tell him, don't miss this. Wake up. Don't miss this. Don't you dare miss this. Wake up right now. This is why Jesus says what he says to them. He says, um, as long as you have the bridegroom, there is no need to fast. There will come a day where the groom will be taken away from you, and then you will need to fast. So here's what he's suggesting deductively, that those of us who need to fast starting March 12th for 21 days are those of us who, when we look back over our life, can honestly admit, I ain't as close to God as I thought I was. You ain't got to say amen right now, but you can say it when you get in your car. I know you came in here with your first Sunday outfit on, and, and I know you look good and clean and sanitized and deodorized and spiritualized and concretized and all that stuff on the outside. But there's some places in your life that you and God ain't as tight as you used to be. You, you, you know, as long as you were going through something, you were talking to God every day. And as soon as he brought you out of it, you and God don't communicate as much as you used to. I told y'all 2017, I'm still saying in 2018, that some of us, man, the worst thing that can happen is for us to get too blessed. Because when we get blessed, we have a tendency to get the big head. Stuff we used to talk to God about, we don't say nothing to God about it no more. As long as you were boo less, you were always talking to God. Soon as you got somebody on your arm, soon as you got your, yourself somebody to slip your arm around them at the church, now all of a sudden you and God don't talk as much as you used to. When you were broke, Oh, you are on the flow calling on the name of Jesus. Soon as you got $10 in your wallet that you ain't got to spend, now you think you shot calling and you and God don't talk as much as you used to talk. Here's what God needs us to understand, that all of us in this room have an area of insufficiency in our life that we need God to get closer to us in that place. And please don't come in here looking like, well, I really don't understand what you're talking about. The devil is a lie. You know exactly what I'm talking about because it just went across your mind. Some things happen in your life that you still ain't thank God for it yet. He opened some doors that you have yet to tell God thank you for opening that door and making that way for me because there was a level of disconnect in all of our lives and what our problem is we think that because we were successful in one area that is substitutes for every other area in our life. Let me tell you what Samuel told King Saul. He says obedience is better than sacrifice. I would rather you obey me than for you to give me a gift just to make me feel good about your level and lack of insufficiency in other areas of your life. So many of us, we need to fast because we ain't as tight as we used to be and God is calling some of us back to that place of commitment and devotion. You used to get up at 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm talking about why you were working out, you will be praying and talking to God, but you didn't miss a few weeks and you hadn't done that. I'm talking to those of you, you in here today, but you picked 
the Sundays out the month that you're going to come to church. I'll show up on first and third, but second and fourth, baby, they're my long weekends, and I ain't going to be able to do it. And you have the nerve and the audacity, and I'm praying for you and your cousin this year because you got the nerve and the audacity to tell God what time you got to get up and go to work in the morning. Shame on you. Don't you ever tell God what time you got to go to work. You mess around and don't have no job messing around with God. You can't pimp God. You can't do him like that because he's a jealous God and he won't have having no other God before him. Can you just look at your neighbor and tell him you need to get closer to God? I, I, I know that ain't what you wanted me to tell you. I know that's not popular. I know it ain't going to make the church go in and shout, but you need to get closer to God. You cuss too much. You need to get closer to God. You still tan the club up. You need to get closer to God. You still laying and playing with everything that passed by. You need to get closer to God. You still selfish. You need to get closer to God. You still one of the top five messiest people in the church. You need to get closer to God. You still want everybody to help you, but you'll never help nobody. You need to get closer to God. You always got your hand out to receive, but when it's time to give, you want to put your hand in your pocket. I ain't got no. You need to get closer to God. You still got a fighting attitude and a fighting spirit. Everywhere you go, you got to get into it with somebody. You need to get closer to God. You late for work every day. You need to get closer to God. Look at your neighbor and tell him you need to get closer to God. So he says to them, <laughs> y'all don't like me today. It's all right. I'm, I'm finna be 34 years old tomorrow. I'm a grown man. You ain't got to say amen to me. I've been doing this 22 years. I stopped preaching for amen about 12, 13 years ago. It don't make me no difference. He says, while they have me, there is no need for them to fast. Since you don't have me. You got to try to get closer because if, if they're fasting to gain more wisdom and guidance, all they have to do is say, Jesus, what you think about? And I'll give them the answer. If, if, they're, if they're believing for a breakthrough, they don't have to fast for it. All they got to do is wake up in the morning and while we're walking, they can just tell me, uh, you know, I'm believing for a breakthrough with my family. And Jesus can just do that right then and there on the spot. You know, they, they don't have to fast for healing. All Jesus had to do, all Peter had to do was tell Jesus, uh, my mother-in-law is sick at the house. She got a fever. It's about 104 and she about to die. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to go to the house. He lays his hand on her and raises her. See, they didn't need, they didn't need medical benefits because he was the benefit. You understand? They, they didn't need money because if you can take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, man, you, you ain't got to go to Publix. You ain't got to go to Walmart and Sam's. He, he got that taken care of. You know, you, you don't need no life jacket, no life boats. You don't need no swimming lesson. You got Jesus. You can walk on water. You don't need all that other stuff. You ain't got to buy nothing to drink. If he can turn water into wine, truly now he can give you some high C and some lemonade and some Kool-Aid every now and then. He, he can do all of that. Jesus says, while they have me, there is no need for them to fast. So that deductively suggests that those who need to fast are those that are not as close to me as they really think they are. Here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't just give them one illustration. He gives them two other illustrations and says, if you don't get that, let me see. Maybe you will get it this way. Maybe you will get it this way. He says, you don't take new garments and patch it up with some old garments. Because what you're going to end up doing is making the tear even worse. Right? So, so you, you don't, watch this, you don't have me and then put something on top of me to make me work better. C can I tell you what the problem at your cousin them church is? This is the problem at your cousin them church. They won't like going over there because they keep putting religion on top of spirituality. So, so, so he, he's given us spirit. 
he's given us spirituality, but we come and put tradition on top of it, and it's making the spirit null and void. Preach, Pastor, I am. So as a consequence, as a consequence, you, you cannot really effectively feel the presence and power of God because we messed around and put our two cents on top of his 100. And we don't even understand that our little two cents is getting ready to sabotage the benefits of his 100% because we put our flavor on top of his. Okay, you didn't like that. Okay, that, let me see if I can preach it a little bit better for you. You see, when God has already set a standard, when God has already designed it how he wanted it, the last thing you want to do is tamper with it to try to make it better because you can't make God better when better is already best with him. He doesn't want us to create a wave. He just wants us to get in and ride the wave that he's already created. So he says, don't you put new garments on top of old because you're going to split the old because the old does not have the strength. It does not have the strength to deal with the new garment that you have placed on top of it. Okay, he says, well, maybe you don't know much about clothes and you, you, you don't do alterations and stuff like that. You don't know much about fabrics. He said, but you do know some about drinking, so let me talk to you about wine. He said, y'all so funny. <laughs> Yeah, somebody knows somebody going to do somebody this evening too, but that's all right. He said, check it. Don't take old bottles, old wineskins, and put new wine into the old wineskins. He says, because if you do that, the new wine is strong. There's a strength to it. There's a power to it that if you put it in the glass that it's only designed to carry that which has been now diluted. It doesn't have the strength to carry that newness that you're placing inside of that bottle. Can I tell you the reason why some of y'all are gifted and frustrated? is because you are the new wine, but you've been trapped in the old wine skins. And the reason it doesn't work for you is because you have allowed for the bottle to burst because you are too strong for the environment that you're in right now. That's the reason why can't nobody on your job stand you because you're smarter than everybody else that you're sitting around the table with. And you've got creativity and you've got ideas and ingenuity that can't nobody else seem to comprehend. So you have become the big fish in the small pond. And they mad at you because you won't dumb yourself down to make mediocre people feel comfortable around you. Who am I preaching to in this room? And so now you live in a big world, but they're mad at you because you won't come down to the small world that they're living in. And as a matter of fact, how many of you, you know you smart, you know you got good sense, but sometimes you can hang around with people that's a little shallow-minded and they'll have you questioning yourself. They'll have you wondering if you a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puff. Yeah, you'll be asking yourself, have I lost my mind? Like, you saying stuff and it's about 10 of them, don't nobody seem to understand what you're saying. They don't understand what you mean, but you know exactly what you're saying, and you know exactly what you mean, and they looking at you like you crazy. I thought about that thing. If I know what I'm saying, and 10 of y'all don't know what I'm saying, I ain't the one that's lost. If I figured it out and you didn't figure it out, don't look at me like I'm crazy. I'm looking at you like you crazy, because if I figured it out, it ain't for me to unfigure it. It's for you to figure it. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen in here. That's the reason some of y'all relationships ain't going right like you wanted to right now because you are in old wine skins. You are a new kid on the block. God has anointed you. He has gifted you. He has given you a watermelon idea, but you're surrounded by people who only have an apple mentality. And whenever you're around people with an apple mentality and you've got a watermelon assignment on your life, they'll never be able to grasp the fullness of what it is that's really trying to get ready to be birthed in your life. I, I tried to tell you that if you got a size 10 foot, but you got a size 9 shoe, you don't have a foot problem. <laughs> tell your neighbor, you got a shoe problem. 
And you got a bigger problem than that when the people that's around you trying to get you to cut your foot off instead of just putting on a bigger side. Y'all ain't talking to me out here. You'll be surprised at how many people would just, just cut your foot off, cut it down one foot size, and fit into the shoe that I have for you when it's easier for you to just increase the shoe size so it will fit the size of the foot that God has given unto me. Here's what Jesus is saying, and I'm done with this. He says, listen, the lesson in fasting is this, that the reason y'all got to do it so often is because you don't walk with me every day. You don't talk with me every day. You don't have me on your side every day. You don't have me to wake up in the middle of the night to have a conversation with me. That's the reason you ain't got but one friend or a cousin left that really likes you, and you got so many other people around you that's hating because they got to do everything. All you got to do is one thing, but they got to do 10 things just to get to where it is that you are. I mean, they got to fast four times a week. And they got to pray seven times a day. And they got to turn east before they call on God. And, and they got to stop doing everything under the sun just to get one breakthrough. And here it is. You don't even pray as much as you should. And you don't read the Bible as much as you should. You know you anointed when you don't read the Bible, but he's still giving you revelation. You ain't even prayed about it, but he's still answering prayer that you thought in your mind that you didn't even speak out of your mouth. Look at all the haters in the room right now that's mad that God giving you favor even when you ain't the best Christian. You don't live holy every day, but he's still being good to you, still being merciful to you, still lifting you up, still holding you up on every list. Who am I preaching to in this room? I know I don't do everything I'm supposed to do, but he still keeps doing everything he's supposed to do. Because when you're close to him, you don't have to do as much. And that's the reason why some of your friends, they know you go to church and they tell you, make sure you pray for me today. <laughs> when you go to church, call his name for me today, you know, because you know what I'm going through. I was going to wait the next Sunday to tell you this, but it's so many to go ahead and tell you right now. I wanted to hold it in, but I can't keep a secret from you. I got to go on and tell you. Um, you, you can tell when you ain't as close to God as you think you are when you need everybody else to pray you out of your situations. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. And please, I'm the first person to intercede. I understand the power of intercession, but please don't get it twisted. If I ask you to pray for me and you go home and forget, I'm still going to be all right. Please don't get it twisted. If I have a little talk with Jesus and tell him all about my troubles, it ain't no question about it. He will hear my faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. He may not come when I want him, but he's always showed up right in the nick of time, right when I needed him. And for those of you that need somebody to pray you through every storm, through every situation, maybe you need to hook up with somebody in this room that knows what it is to anoint their own head with oil. I'm talking about when you were sick and didn't nobody come to your bedside. You learn how to turn your face to the wall and say, Lord, if don't nobody else pray for me, I know that you're a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. And me and you going to get me up out of this bed. Me and you going to help me pull myself up by the bootstraps and all shall be well. You don't need everybody to stand in the gap for you. Look at your name and tell them, pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Call out the name of the Lord on behalf of your own situation. You can anoint your own house. You can anoint your own children. You can pray over your own body. and Pray over your own finances. And pray over your own community. You don't need everybody on your side. You just need God on your side. And if God be for us, mm, who can be against us? So the closer you are to him, he says, their fasting is necessary, but there will come a day where they won't have me anymore. I won't be walking with them. I won't be talking with them. I won't be down here performing miracles, and then it'll be time for them to start fasting. Let me drop this in your spirit, and I know all of us are close to God, but let me give you one unfortunate reality 
Jesus ain't walking down here no more. So every now and then, when you feel a disconnect from him, one of the ways I get closest to him is when I give up what I need to allow him to supply it for me. That, that, that's, that's what fasting really does. That's why I'm calling for 21 days starting March 12th for us to enter into 21 days of fasting because if you believe in God for a year of manifestation, here's what's in important and critical that each of us understand, that if I'm believing God to supply it, then I need to let him do it. Because if I got to supply it, then God can't supply it. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but in 2018, I want God to bless me. Amen. You feel what I'm saying, Ms. Tony? I, 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 want, I want God to bless because Because when, when folks start blessing you, their resources are limited. They, they, they can't supply all of your needs. Their, their resources are limited. They have a place where they stop. They're they going to have a cut off when it comes to you because they're going to look out for themselves before they look out for you. But how many know that God has a capacity that never runs out? It never runs dry. He's got new mercy every day. He's got new mercy every morning. That's why you ain't got to hate on somebody that get a raise or a promotion because God got raises and promotion that they don't even know about. and The, the blessings don't come from the east of the west, but they come from God above. And the heart of the king is in the hand of God. When he gets ready to bless you, he doesn't have to ask anybody else's permission to do it. When Jesus says yes, nobody else can say no. And when God gets ready to bless you, there's nothing that a devil in hell can do to stop it. Because when God says you're blessed, you're blessed. When he says you're above and not beneath, you're above and not beneath. When he says you're a lender and not a borrower, then you're a lender and not a borrower. When he says you're healed and whole, you are healed and whole. So we're telling God, I'm giving up what I need to watch you supply it for me. And the more you give up what you need and watch him give you what's really a necessity, you don't get mad when people tell you no. <laughs> Rejection don't bother you because I'm used to telling myself no. I'm used to rejecting my own flesh. I'm used to rejecting my own body. I, I'm used to going for a day at a time or 21 days at a time without eating certain foods that I really like. So when you tell me, uh-uh, you think I'm going to turn my head and tuck my tail and run with tears streaming down my face, the devil is a liar. Because if, if God can supernaturally supply me with my physical sustenance, then what won't God do in your life? Whatever you give up in an attempt to obey God, he'll give it back to you 100-fold. Watch this, in this life. They told us that serving the Lord would pay off after a while. That's a little true. But eight of y'all know that serving the Lord will pay off. Just look at somebody and do this right here. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Not next year. This year right here. Not even next week. This week right here. Not next month. This month right here. Serving the Lord will pay off in this life, 100 fold, it'll pay off in this life right now. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word, for the strength, the power, for the validity of your word. Your word is real. Your word is true. God, some of us are closer to you than others, but none of us are as close to you as we should be. So thank you for making up that gap, for sealing every for, for sealing every void, and for filling up every crack that we've had. Thank you for Calvary that when we couldn't reach to you, you stretched your arms wide to reach out and grab us with one hand and reach out and touch God with the other. I stand in agreement with my brothers and my sisters today that they will take you seriously. 
Take your presence seriously. Take your joy seriously. For every bad storm, for every bad situation, some way, somehow, you got us through it. And we honor you for that. And if you did it before, you'll do it again. The same God right now is the same God back there. I give you praise to my brothers and my sisters who have their hands lifted, who receive this phone. For those that choose not to receive it, God, this prayer is not even intended to direct itself to them, but to only those who will receive it. You said as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. So we stand on your word today. You are inclusive, but you are not intrusive. For those of us who are receivers of you, we take you wholeheartedly. Bless now as only you can. Fill us till we want no more. And we give you praise for it and count it done. In Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands and give God a praise today for